Good morning, ABC. Let's start that again. Good morning, ABC. To open up a, bapt- a service, a worship service, and through the baptismal waters. Today, there will be eight candidates that are getting baptized. And if you are attached to any of these candidates, I encourage you to stand as a sign of support and encouragement um, for them and before the Lord. And as I baptize each candidate, I'm going to encourage each one of you, especially with so many of our young ones getting baptized, that you pray for them as they're getting baptized. All right, the first one is a brother and a sister coming together. Emma? This precious, precious family. Emma's been the oldest, Tyler's the second. Um, And as they have been a part of IBC for uh, several years, we've been blessed with them. They've been very faithful in Sunday school. But where God touched each of their hearts was during VBS last year. And as they prayed to receive Christ, and even though, again, they've been growing up in church all their life, they came to their own faith. And Emma, before your family and before God and before all of us here, who do you confess? Jesus Christ is Lord. I now baptize you, my little sister, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. This is Tyler. This is, um, I love the, the, this family because they come in and chat with me quite occasionally. And um, it's always been fun to catch up with them in their journey. But I know this is, is a very important day. And Tyler, not only are you a brother in Christ with your, a, a brother, blood brother with your sister, but now you're a brother in Christ. And when you accepted Christ in VBS, you became a part of the family of God. And so who do you confess today? Jesus Christ is Lord. I now baptize you, my little brother, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. The next one is Hannah. As I told her, I knew her while she was still in her mother's womb. Um, So she, her mom and dad have been here a long, long time, but even before my time. But this one is very precious to us. And, And as she stands before you, she too accepted Christ during VBS. And now she stands before you. And Hannah, before your family and before all of us here, who do you confess? Jesus Christ is Lord. I now baptize you, my little sister, in the name of the Father, name of the Son, and name of the Holy Spirit. The next one we have the privilege is Emma. And Emma has been a part of our church for years, and yet um, I love her um, testimony and her story. Um, Both of her brothers were baptized earlier, um, several years ago, but she kind of came on her own journey. And part of that journey was making sure that her faith was her own. And she had a chance to pray with her mom and dad at home. And now she stands before you, not only before her blood family, but your family in Jesus Christ as well. And Emma, before all of us here, who do you confess? Jesus Christ is Lord. I now baptize you, my little sister, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. This one, um, Kalisa has been a part of our church for several years. I think six we were calculating the other day. But they've been very, very faithful on Saturday night. And I said, you sure you want to be baptized on Sunday morning? And she did. She said, yes. Um, And now she stands before you. She came to faith several years ago. But as a child, not only in age, but childlike faith. And that faith is very real. But today, before your family and before all of us here, who do you confess? Jesus Christ is Lord. I now baptize you, my little sister, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. This is Jaden. About a year ago, I baptized his brother, um, but their family has been a part of our church for several years. We've had a, quite a few interesting conversations together across his dinner table with him. Remember the dirty heart? And then the time in VBS where he got again the, the message of Jesus Christ. And in the VBS a year plus ago, he too opened your heart up to Christ. And now you get to stand before your family, before your friends, and before your IBC family in the world 
And who do you confess, Jaden? Jesus Christ is Lord. I now baptize you, my little brother, in the name of the Father, name of the Son, name of the Holy Spirit. The next is a couple that we've been working with um, just in their journey spiritually, but also in their relationship as well. This is Fiona, and Casey is right behind me. He's coming. Keep coming. Okay. Um, we've had the privilege of sharing what Jesus has done and hearing what Jesus has done. And Fiona's testimony, she's grown up in a church environment, but yet coming to her own faith was part of that journey. And she said where it really kicked in, coming to IBC and hearing the word and digging into the word herself and finding out what the word is telling her to do. And so before Casey, before your IBC family, who do you confess? Jesus Christ is Lord. I now baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, name of the Son, name of the Holy Spirit. This is Casey. Um, his story is quite fascinating and intriguing. Um, there's a lot of um, strands of religion in his background that weren't Christian. And yet, out of all of that, God gave him a friend who invited him not only to come to church, but also to sh see what Christ is really like. And as he saw that, he was drawn to that. And he too, have, over the last time here, several months that he's been coming to IBC, He's grown attached to the word of God, but also to the family of God here. And so now for the very first time before God and all of us here, Casey, who do you confess? Jesus Christ is Lord. I now baptize you in the name of the Father, name of the Son, name of the Holy Spirit. I don't think there's a better way to celebrate what God has done is the baptism. So now I'm gonna ask the children if you would make your way. Let's continue to worship the Lord with our in spirit and in truth. Good morning, IBC. Praise the Lord for the baptisms we've just witnessed. We're so excited that God made the restart of the children's choirs possible earlier this month. And this morning, the children are worshiping God together with all of us. In Exodus 3, verse 15, God says, The Lord is the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Our God is a God of both the young and the old across all generations. This morning we'll do something a little bit different. Sometimes you hear me say the call to the worship. Indeed, worship starts with God's revelation or God telling us who he is and then we respond. We talk to God like a dialogue. And so what better than to have the call to worship from the word of God. And the Psalms, or the Psalter, has been an essential worship resource throughout the centuries of church history. And so as we get started today, I will ask the children to join me in reading the call to worship. Let's stand. Let's read together. Psalm 100, verses 1 to 3. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pastures. Amen. In this season of choir, one element we hope to incorporate is to teach children some basic concepts about worship in addition to singing songs and engaging in fun musical activities. The theme of this semester's curriculum is We Are God's Masterpiece based on Ephesians 2.10. So the children are learning, experiencing how they are wonderfully created by God with gifts and talents that they can develop and use to serve God and others. So the elementary group will uh, share a fun song first, followed by all singing the theme song, uh, We Are God's Masterpiece. And we invite you to join in the actions at the chorus as an encouragement to them and as uh, your act of worship as well.
Let's give the children another hand of encouragement. Here in IBC, we are not only diverse in our nationalities, our backgrounds, but we also have various generations represented in this family of God. Our triune God, who reveals himself as three in one, one in three, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the mutual indwelling, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit with all of the persons of God, is perhaps the most beautiful picture of unity in diversity. I'd like to take this opportunity to share on behalf of the worship and children's ministries next Sunday on October 6th, also in celebration of Children's Day on October 4th, we are gonna co come together in worship as a body of Christ, and we will welcome the children to join their parents in worship here in the sanctuary. Uh, we will have musical worship together. We'll sing Holy, Holy, Holy as the opening hymn. And for those that are baptized, they will partake in the Lord's Supper together with their families. Uh, there's also baby dedications at 11 a.m. And so we think that um, it's going to be a meaningful experience at the Lord's table for all of us. So we encourage families to worship and sit together. And after that, then before the sermon, the children will be dismissed to their respective Sunday school classes in L1. Pastor Ronnie and I encourage you to come with open minds and loving hearts, rooted in the reality that brothers, sisters in Christ, we are all beloved children of our triune God. Thank you. This morning, I'd like to welcome all of you, especially uh, those of you who are first time here. None? All right, you're all welcome. Yeah, as Pastor Rodney always say, this is the holiest of service, and today is especially uh, special because we just have our baptism. Uh, so now, uh, we'd like to share with you what's happening in our church as well. We would have... Uh, the Hope Conference, and uh, Early Bird uh, is going to start this coming Tuesday, October 1st, and I would like to welcome Daryl to speak more about Hope Conference. Thanks, Henry. Good morning. So, <clears throat> in our first ever church conference post-COVID, uh, we all remember that, right? COVID. Uh, we will rediscover, understand, and experience the hope that comes from God alone and find practical ways to live it out and share it with those around us. Through worship, workshops, and fellowship time, we will embark on a journey of spiritual renewal. Margaret and Lucy will be our primary speakers for the women's sessions, which are on Friday and Saturday, November 22nd and 23rd. Margaret is not new to IBC, as she was also a keynote speaker at the 2017 Weave Women's Conference. She authored several of the books that our women use in their Bible study groups and was recently named one of 50 women most shaping culture of the church and the church today by Christianity Today. Lucy had also previously joined our ladies at the 2018 Poema Women's Christmas Lunch. She is author of two books, Joy Beyond Cancer and When It Is Beyond Me. Her life is a story of hope, joy, and purpose beyond adversity. The men's session will be all on Saturday, November 23rd only, and Leif will be our guest, our special guest speaker. Margaret describe, describes her husband, Leif, as a man who radiates so much kindness and tenderness towards others. He has lived out and seen firsthand how individuals and communities can demonstrate the love of God and others in their unique spheres of influence. Leif is excited to share how his relationship with others has impacted his journey with Christ, both personally and professionally. On, the top of the, on top of the plenary sessions, there will be eight workshops led by our fellow IBCers and other ministry partners. You may find out more details on our official event page, ibcs.org slash hope conference. Remember, early bird starts on Tuesday, October 1st. Thank you, Daryl. Yeah, you might want to set your alarm. Early bird discount, October 1st, and it will end on October 14th. Not exactly, you know, have to be done at 0001. All right, 
uh, now our Old Testament survey, we just completed the book of law. So uh, it's not too late to join and uh, join Pastor Rodney for Old Testament survey. Next, uh, the Church Center app. Uh, it's free, and if you haven't installed it or you need help, you can actually approach any of us. Uh, we'll be uh, in the gathering center after the service. And that's uh, for Church Center app. All right, uh, let's, uh, let us open with prayers. Father God in heaven, we truly want to thank you for you have uh, sent your son Jesus to die for our sins. We pray, Father, that you will send your Holy Spirit to be with each one of us as we worship you. May the songs that we have sung, may the worship that we're raising be sweet, sweet fragrance in your sight. In Jesus' name, Father, we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to IBC, and we're so glad that you're here with us today. And it was such a blessing that we start our service with baptism and also with children's choir. And I would like um, to um, ask for your help. Um, since we are quite full uh, this morning, then um, if you can um, make yourself closer to each other, Towards the middle, it will be very helpful. Thank you. And we will um, continue our praise and worship. And I would like to invite all of you to stand. Praise God from whom all blessings Praise to the King. Praise to the King, His throne transcends, His crown and kingdom never end. Now and throughout eternity, I praise the One who died.
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind because I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power Your name is healing Your name Jesus, over fear and all anxiety, to every soul held captive by depressions, I speak Jesus. Your name is power. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name. over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus shout Jesus from the mountains Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name, Jesus.
Sing this look at the amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. safe and your grace will lead us home to you thank you for this time of worship thank you for this opportunity to be here together with our brothers and sisters in Christ thank you for this opportunity to worship freely and also to grief to give freely 
May this offering be used for your kingdom to help others in need, to bring glory to you. We pray for wisdom for Pastor Rodney. May you use him to deliver your message. May we listen with open heart and open mind and for us to understand your words and apply them in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you, Anderson. Thank you, team. If you have your Bibles, and by the way, if you're new here or you've been visiting for a little bit, Bibles are all the things we always open up to. So if you want to bring it on your phone or if you want to bring it in your hand, we'd love to see that. But every sermon you'll hear, open up your word. So open up to Jeremiah. We're making our way to Jeremiah chapter 11. As you make your way, you remember last week was hope in the midst of sorrow. And the question was, how in the world does sorrow have anything to do with hope? And doesn't hope alleviate sorrow? But today it's even worse, would you say? Complaining. How many of you live or work with somebody who complains? Just raise your hand if you live or work with somebody who complains. I'm not saying point at them, because some of you are pointing at that. But would you say that we are a encouraging um, um, church or are we a complaining church? That was not a rhetorical question. But we are in the midst of complaining. I think this is what's so kind of encouraging about Jeremiah. Because Jeremiah reveals some things about a man, of, a man of God, but yet you see him struggle. If you've ever studied the book of Jeremiah in depth, you know that there is a special section or category that falls into the prophecy of Jeremiah called, many of the writers call it his complaints or his confessions or his laments, there are six of them, and we'll cover two of them today. And a lot of people call them confessions, but I think if you come from the Catholic tradition, it doesn't make sense because confession is you go into a booth and you confess your sins to a priest, but this is not that. When you use the word confessions the way they use it in Jeremiah, we wanna substitute that with the word lament, anguish, painful expressions, and complaining. So as we walk through this Jeremiah, I want to encourage you before we get to the text in Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 18, that something that Jeremiah's complaints or his confessions or his laments or his anguishes teaches us. First of all, it shows us that even in our spiritual journey, we can have spiritual highs and spiritual lows. Sometimes we're flying high and sometimes we're crashing and burning. Sometimes we are exhilarated and sometimes we're, we're just exhausted and depleted. Jeremiah will encourage you in that, that you're not alone. The other one is that God uses imperfect people. How many of you are at least a little bit encouraged by that? That he uses, in fact, I think he prefers imperfect people. And so he can use us. But the final one, which is a little bit more challenging before we get to the text, especially in Asia, especially in Singapore, and especially in IBC, it is this. Jeremiah will give us a model that we can be open and transparent about our weaknesses about our struggles, about our setbacks, about our failures, about our uh, um, adversity, our hardship, our trials. Oftentimes in this context, it's very difficult to not keep face. And yet Jeremiah tells us the opposite, that whenever we're on a, a journey of, of agony and anguish and pain, that it's okay to share that with one another. And he gives us that permission to do that through Jeremiah. Now, when it comes to complaints, you have a wide range. Again, how many of you ever seen a complaint box outside of an organization that you could drop your complaints or your comments or whatever? But I came across an interesting complaint or comment box. It was in Wyoming. Many of you know that's a northern state in the U.S. It's in the middle of nowhere. 
And they're known for their wilderness, their hiking trails, their mountainous regions. And so one particular national park had a comment box that ended up being a complaint box. And so they deposited their complaints in this national forest that was used for hiking and all that stuff. And these were the complaints that came out. One said, an escalator would help on steep uphill sections. So if you want to go to a wilderness hiking thing and you want escalators, you can drop that comment in. The second one, I love this one, the places where trails do not exist are not well marked. Interesting complaint. But my favorite one is this, there are too many rocks on this mountain. Now we have those complainers, right, that will complain about every single little thing. But then you have a diver, or maybe end of the pendulum, other swings. Um, you have Mark Twain who says, don't ever share your complaints or your problems for two reasons. First one, 80% of the people you tell your complaints to really don't care. The other 20% think it's your fault anyway. So again, you have totally different response to complaints. So today, I'm gonna to encourage you that if you are a complainer or you live with those complainers, that God will actually respond to Jeremiah's complaints. So there'll be two complaints. The first one is found in chapter 11, verses 18 through 23, and he will complain about something very legitimate. It is a legitimate complaint. It is not like superficial or like um, um, little idiosyncrasies or nuance. This is a big one. His first complaint to God is his life is being threatened. Big complaint. Second complaint is a little bit larger. It's chapter 12 forward. As we move into this complaint, his complaint is more on a general scale that I think comes out of the first complaint. First complaint is why, uh, that they threaten my life. I'm being your prophet, your mouthpiece, your conduit, and yet people are threatening me with my own life. They want uh, literally to cut me off from the land of the living. The second complaint is a complaint that I think all of us have had at one time or another. Why do the wicked prosper? Why do the godless seem to be the ones that are most blessed? So we'll deal with that complaint. So let's pick up the first one. Chapter 11, verse 18. This is his complaint, his confession, his lament. Moreover, Lord, the Lord made it known to me and I knew it. Then you showed me their deeds. So God gave him a revelation. What was the revelation? But I was like a gentle lamb in verse 19, led to the slaughter. I did not know that they had devised plots against me, saying, let us destroy the tree with its fruit, and let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name be remembered no more. So for some reason, and somehow, God revealed to him that there was a plot. And where did this plot come from? In verse 21, it says, therefore, thus says the Lord, concerning the men of Anathoth. So Anathoth was his home village. So these men, these villagers, maybe family, relatives, friends that he grew up with, have now plotted against him, and it was revealed to Jeremiah. It came to his attention, whether directly through a vision, through a dream, through a spoken word, or indirectly through somebody else passing that information on to him. You remember in the New Testament, Paul was in prison, and his nephew found out that they were plotting, there was a group of Jews that were plotting his death um, when they transferred him from one prison to the other, so that plot was thwarted. So you get a sense that always God is always protecting. In fact, Jeremiah's only protection at this threat of his life is found in Jeremiah 1, when God says, I will deliver you from any of your enemies. So he has that as his only protection. But in that revelation of God revealing the plot, Jeremiah is going to reveal his part to God. And he opens up in verse 19, he says, but I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter, and I did not know they had devised plots against me. So what he's saying is a, a gentle lamb led to the slaughter is, first of all, innocent, unknowing. So he's surprised. He says, this plot was not known to me, so it caught him off guard. I don't know if you've ever been deceived, betrayed by someone close to you, a family member, and it's caught you off guard. When a family member turns against you, when somebody that you trusted all of a sudden stabs you in the back, undermines you. One that you thought were on your side now is on the opposition side. Somebody who's turned against you. This is what he feels like, a gentle lamb, unaware, surprised, innocent, led to the slaughter. And then he goes into this graphic detail about what they're going to do to him, that they're going to um, take a, a, they're going to destroy the tree with his fruit, which means not only him, but any offspring he may have in the future. 
They were literally going to cut him off the land of the living in such a way that he not will ever be remembered anymore. In fact, their goal was that no one would know that he even existed. So what does Jeremiah do? He reveals his heart. Look at verse 20. But O Lord of hosts who judges righteously, and so he goes back to the Lord. He said, who tries the feelings of the heart. Then he says, let me see your vengeance on them, for to you I've committed my cause. That word that's translated in uh, New American Standard, committed my cause, literally means I revealed my cause to you. That means I've opened up my heart. I, I've held nothing back. Do an x-ray on me, do a CAT scan, do an MRI on my spirit, and you will see, Lord, I, I've revealed my heart to you. This is what I feel. I feel like a gentle lamb. My friends, my family, my relatives have turned against me. They have plotted for my murder. Well, then he asked, the Lord says, look what he says, very keen observation. He said, Lord, let your vengeance be upon them. So again, part of the characteristic of a, a, these confessions or complaints is he's asking God's vengeance on them. Do you know there's a difference between God's vengeance and my vengeance? How many of you have ever been hurt and you're going to say, if you do bad to me, I'll do bad to you. If you're mean to me, I'm mean to you. You cut me off, I'll cut you off. And we always give people back what they've given to us, and we take our own revenge, but this is not what he says. He doesn't say, I'm gonna get back at them. He said, Lord, give them your vengeance. Big difference between the two. In fact, if you go through the New Testament in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, the apostle Paul says, never take out your own revenge, but leave room for the wrath of God. So God's not saying that they're gonna get away with it. He's just saying it's not up to us, so let it go. He's saying, don't take out your own revenge. And Jeremiah has given us at least a motto of that that says, Lord, you give them your vengeance. So how does God respond? Look how he responds in judgment in verse 21. Therefore, thus says the Lord, concerning the men of Anathoth, these are our family, these are friends, these are relatives. He says, Anathoth, who are seeking your life, do not prophesy in the name of the Lord so that you will not die at the hand. Basically, they're saying, you silence your message or we will silence you permanently. Now, what are they offended about? We've been looking through the prophecies of Jeremiah, and his targets are the priests and the prophets, the religious leaders. And in Anathoth, it was a community of priests. Remember the name Abathar, who was served as priest under King David. He was ousted after King Solomon took the throne, and so he was um, sent basically back to his home village of Anathoth. So we know that there's a whole bunch of priests there. Maybe they were offended by Jeremiah's message directed against them. Maybe they were offended by his message of saying, we're gonna side with the Babylonians and they considered or deemed him to be a traitor that you went to the enemy side. So now they're saying, you silent your message or we'll silence you. But look what God does on Jeremiah's behalf. He says in verse 22, therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I'm about to punish them. The young men will die by the sword and their sons and daughters will die by famine. They're not gonna get away with it, verse 23. And a remnant will not be left to them. A lot of times the Jews always feel like, oh, at least we have a remnant, we've got a little bit left. But, oh, there's always gonna be a few saved, but not here. And the Lord says, I will bring disaster on the men of Anathoth and the year of their punishment. In this sense, he's asking for God's, again, his vengeance, and God says, I will punish them. I hear your prayers, I hear your complaint. An observation, very quick observation. If you notice when he's led like a lamb led to slaughter, you notice that he was betrayed by his friends and family. Does that sound familiar to anybody? About who else feels that? The Lord Jesus was like a lamb led to the slaughter. He too also was betrayed by a very close friend. But where Jeremiah is asking for the Lord's vengeance on his enemies, the Lord himself has asked for forgiveness for those who put him on the cross. Many of you remember the name Jonathan Edwards that I mentioned last week, famous sermon, sinners in the hands of the angry God, where you're dangling over the fire by a thread, like a spider's thread, hanging on. And, and so he gives this message, and hundreds of people come to Christ. There's an awakening that takes place in the northeastern part of the United States during that time period. But that was in 1741. In 1750, the church voted to fire Jonathan Edwards probably the greatest theologian, the greatest mind of the 18th century in the United States. He had written volumes. He's an unbelievable theologian, unbelievable pastor. And the church, his own church, fired him. The final vote, 230 against, 23 for. 
So what was the reason they fired him? Because he required everyone who took the Lord's Supper to be a believer. And there were many of those who were unregenerate, had never confessed their faith in Christ, who were trying to take communion, and he would not let them, and they fired him. Jonathan Edwards, Jonathan, and Jeremiah, they understand when people turn against them. So that's the first complaint. Now we come to the second complaint. Pick up in chapter 12. And in this complaint, he's going to raise a very troubling question which we all have asked at one time or another. Let's pick up in verse 1. It says, righteous are you. Remember, he just said you judge righteously, so he's going before the judge. And he says that I would plead my case with you. Indeed, I would discuss matters of justice. So you get this impression that we're in a legal realm now, and that he's presenting and he's filing a complaint, a charge against the wicked that he's about to mention. So what's his complaint? Look in the middle of verse 1. Who has a way, who has the way of the wicked, or why has the way of the wicked prospered? Why are all those who deal in treachery at ease. Basic general question, why do the wicked prosper? Habakkuk has asked that same question. Malachi says, you call good evil. You call those who are arrogant blessed. It seems like everything is turned upside down. So let me ask a gentle question to you today. Anybody know wicked people who look like they're flourishing? They just look like they're doing well. It looks like, man, they don't even have to lift a finger. It seems like everything goes in their favor. They get the right school. They have jobs. They get promotions. They look like they get blessed. They have all these possessions. They look like they are in favor. In contrast to us, we're trying. We're walking with God, and it seems like we never get promoted. It seems like no blessings come our way. It seems like we constantly have struggles. Always our marriage is in a mess. Our kids are prodigals. We go through all of this stuff, and we're going, where is the favor of God? And the wicked are flourishing. They're prospering. Even Psalm 73, the most famous psalm that says, why do the wicked prosper? Why are they flourishing? Why are they successful? You could feel it in his bones. You could, this anguish, this, this pain. Verse 2, though, then will reveal a little bit more of his confusion he says, you have planted them, and they have also taken root. They grow, and they have even produced fruit. But you, you are near to their lips, but you're far from their mind and their heart. So if you go back to Psalm 1, basic principle, we've quoted this verse a lot, early part of the year. It says, blessed are those who do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the paths of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And he will be, hear this, that he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. So what Jeremiah is saying is everything is upside down. We're righteous, and we're not bearing fruit. They're unrighteous, and they're flourishing. It seems like they're doing ungodly things, like they keep the Lord on their lips, like just through mechanical, going through the motions a facade, but in their heart, they've forsaken you, and yet you're causing them to grow and be fruitful and be blessed and be successful and be prosperous. What is the problem here? And again, his pain is in his heart. You could feel his pain. Some of you are very familiar with the history of Belgium. There's a king, famous king by the name of King Leopold in the late 1800s. He kind of associated with the church in Belgium. He also presented himself as a benefactor of a benevolent person who would go to Africa, and he targeted the country of Congo. In fact, we had two guests from Congo last week here at IBC. So he targeted Congo, but he began to exploit them with the rubber, with the merchandise, he, he put the, with ivory. Then he put the people in slavery. He would torture them. He would hang children. He, there was mass amputations. He profited from this ungodly um, business and trade that he was the richest man in the world, $1 billion in profit. And yet, in his mouth, in his appearance, it looked like he was benevolent and he was helping Congo, and he ended up killing half the population. 10 million people died under that regime. And yet, we see it looks like they're flourishing. So then he turns inward. Look what he says in verse 3. But you know me, O oh Lord. You see me. You, you examine my heart toward you. He says, you've taken a spiritual EKG. You've taken an x-ray, an MRI. You've examined me. You know my heart. So why are they threatening death? Why are they prospering? 
Why am I live righteously and yet my life is hanging in the balance? And yet they who are ungodly, who go through the motions and whose hearts have forsaken God, now they are flourishing. They're fruitful. They're prosperous. They're successful. But then he says, and again, these are confessions, right? He says, drag them off like sheep for the slaughter and set them apart for the day of carnage. So what does that mean? The word drag literally means to uproot them, pull them up from the roots and drag them to slaughter and kill them. Verse four, how long is the land to mourn? So whenever wicked prosper, even the land begins to suffer. It says that the vegetation of the countryside to wither for the wickedness of those who dwell in it. Animals and birds have been snatched away because men have said he will not see our latter end. And so basically, whenever wicked do their thing, nature even suffers. And it looks like everyone else suffers except the ones who cause it. And some of you may or may not know this atheist by the name of Seth MacFarlane. But he's famous for this making cartoons that mock Jesus and Christianity. I looked up his worth, like, you know how they, they, they put it on the internet, like how much is a person's worth? So this mocker of Jesus' crucifixion, his character, of all these things, he's also an atheist, his net worth, $300 million. So you're going, hey, why are the wicked prospering? We're barely making it from week to week, from month to month. We're, we're overwhelmed with pressures, and yet they seem to be flourishing. Well, let me gently encourage you not to answer with this, because this is a common response. First one is, the Lord is not in control. How many of you have ever doubted that? Like, oh, the Lord is not in control. Look, why would this happen in, in this country? Why would this happen with this regime? If the Lord was in control, why, why would this happen with the righteous people suffering? And why are the wicked flourishing? Is God in control? So you question whether or not God is in control and that the evil people can do whatever they want and they're bringing about their own success. The second response that is also tragic and maybe even more troubling is if you say that the Lord is in control and he doesn't care. He doesn't care if you suffer. He doesn't care if the wicked are prospered. He's in control but just doesn't care. Well, God's gonna respond to his complaint, maybe to ours as well, in verses five and six. So this is what he says. If you run with the footmen, they have tired you out. Then how can you compete with the horses? So if you're running with the footmen and they tire you out, how are you gonna compete in the next level competing with the horses? Second analogy. Then how can you, if you fall down in the land of peace, how will you do in the thicket or the jungle of the Jordan? So if you can't hang or can't handle it when everything is peaceful around you relatively, and then how are you going to ever get into the thicket of the Jordan, which is dangerous? So he doesn't really directly answer my question or Jeremiah's question. Why are the wicked prospering? He actually takes our attention off of the wicked, and he places the attention on you and me. He's saying that, yes, all of these things are going on around you, but they're used for your conditioning. They're used for your spiritual condition in order that you may be prepared for the path that God has ahead of you that it will become more difficult and more challenging. So let's pick up the footman. So if you're running with the footman, and, and it's just like you're just exhausted, you're just, you're just running, you're trying your best, doing everything you can, and, and, and then you're, you faint or you get tired. So what is he talking about with Jeremiah? If, if you're in your home country, in your home village, and they betray you, and they're sending death threats against you, and, and, and they turned against you, and you feel isolated, and, and if you can't handle this, by the way, Jeremiah, it's going to get worse. So God has given him a test here to grow his faith, and yet he's flunking. He's tiring out. He's exhausted. Then how in the world, if you're in that, how are you going to compete with the horses? What horses is he talking about? Well, the horses that are coming in from Babylon, you haven't even been invaded yet. You haven't been taken over by the northern tribes that are coming in from Babylon that are going to come in on horses. And so that's definitely a direct analogy. But I actually did some speed checks. I don't know how fast some of you are, but the fastest human being ever recorded is Bolt from Jamaica during the Olympics where he set the world record in the 100 meters. And he was running ready. He was clocked at 44 kilometers an hour. How many of you are kind of in that range? Just raise your hand. Anybody here 44 kilometers an hour? He only ran at 100 meters, but he ran 44 kilometers an hour. 
Now, if you're a horse, they've been clocked as fast as, ready for this, 70 kilometers an hour. So even bolts, the fastest human, cannot outrun the horses. So what is that going on? So I, I love to run for only one reason, because I love to play basketball. So I run to play. That's the only reason I run. Other than that, I hate running. But as I run, I, ha I have one fear. So as I'm running on PCN or on the canal, as I'm running, my fear is when I hear footsteps. So as I'm running, I hear footsteps, and I know those footsteps are coming up fast. And my only prayer is that that person that is going to pass me, because I'm not looking behind me, I'm just praying that that person is not 80 years old. <laughs> the moment an 80-year-old passes me is the moment you will see me spiral in deep, dark depression. But if I'm running, and I'm trying to run as best as I can, that's what he's saying. If you're running with the footman, and you are tired, you're exhausted, you're depleted, you're defeated, how in the world are you going to compete with the horses? Now, some of you say, well, Pastor, I'm okay running with a footman. In fact, I'll walk with a footman. I'm okay. But that's not what God is saying. God is saying he's conditioning each and every one of us because what's ahead is going to be hard. Now, how many of you know that this is PSLE week? Anybody know that? This is the most holy week of all of Singapore. It's like, like a Passover, Pentecost, right? It's like the week. But yet, if, if you're at P1 and you're struggling, how many of you say, if you think this is tough, you wait to P2? And if you're struggling at PSLE, what's it going to be like at O levels or A levels or uni or whatever it might be? And this is what God is saying to us. If you're struggling with where you are now, what's ahead is going to be even more challenging and more difficult. How many of you have ever thought, man, if, if we can just get our preschoolers into school, our life is going to be so easy? How many of you have ever delusionally thought that? You think, okay, my life is better when we get our, our kids from being primary and then they'll be in secondary school and our life is going to be easy because they think for themselves, they dress for themselves, they, they can handle anything. And then they turn into godly teenagers, correct? And then we think, oh, if they get out of secondary school and get into uni, all of our problems are done, right? It's going to get easier. How many of you have uni students? Has it gotten easier? Trust me, I talk to many of you. It has not. So we think that, oh, if we can just, like, God is preparing us for what's ahead. The second analogy, if you fall in a land of peace, which is, again, his own territory, Anathoth, yes, with his priests and prophets and family, yes, with the betrayal and death threats, then how are you going to run in the thicket of the Jordan, which I call the Jordan jungle, which is dangerous, lion infested? Now, remember, Jeremiah is at this point in life these are the threats that are coming against him from his own people. But guess what he's about to experience? He's about to be put in jail. He's about to be beaten. He gets out of jail. Then they throw him back in. They're going to throw him into a cistern, and he's going to sink in the mud. He's about to drown in a bunch of wet mud from a cistern until somebody ties a bunch of sheets together to pull him out. It's going to get worse for him. So no matter where you are, God is conditioning you. He's training you. So you can complain all you want to about the wicked prospering, the righteous suffering, things not going your way. But if you fall down in the land of peace and if you cannot run with a footman, how in the world are you going to grow in the season that's ahead of you? Challenging words. Bishop Desmond Tutu, some of you recognize that name. It's an Anglican priest from Cape Town that won the 1986 Nobel Peace Prize. Some of you know the history of South Africa and the racial divide and tension centuries there. Just difficult. And yet, in 1992, he was asked, are you hopeful? And this is what he says, I'm always hopeful. I love that. And you know where the context in which he speaks. Then he says, Christians are prisoners of hope. Interesting analogy, right? We're prisoners of hope. He said, you cannot imagine a more hopeless position and a place and a time than Good Friday. That was hopeless. Son of God's on the cross. Disciples are fleeing. Looks like the enemy is one. But he says, and he closes with this, it's very powerful. He says, there's no situation for God in which God cannot extract good. Then he finally says, evil, death, oppression, and justice can never again have the last word. We are prisoners of hope. We can't get away from it. We're Christians. No matter what is happening around us, God is going to win. Why? Because God is training you for what's ahead. That's why in the New Testament, they can say, I can do all things through what? Christ who strengthens me. Romans 8 says, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So it's not on our strength that we can compete with the horses or 
run and fight in the thicket. It's with the power of God, and that's what he's teaching Jeremiah. Now, that's where he deals with that complaint. But then in verse 7, he reverts and says, it looks like the wicked are winning, but trust me, Jeremiah, I've got it. Look what he says in verse 7. I have forsaken my house. I've abandoned my inheritance. I've given my beloved, the beloved of my soul into the hands of the enemies. He said, what you think they're doing well, they're not. Remember, they have me on their lips, but they don't have me in their mind in verse 2. He says, I will punish them. I will take care of them, even though it looks like nothing is happening right now. Look at these words, forsaken, abandoned, give you over. God is not light about this. To me, it's a tragic scene that he delivers his people over as he releases them to the sins and to the things that are ahead of them. So what's ahead of them? As he releases them, what is their response? Look in verse eight. My inheritance, that's Judah, has become to me like a lion in the forest. She has roared against me. So when God places Judah under discipline, when he forsakes, abandons, gives them over to the enemies, then what happens? Instead of breaking down in repentance and coming back to God in humility, they actually rise up and roar in defiance like a lion. We see this happen in IBC all the time. We confront people in their sin. We admonish them when they walk away from their marriage, their home, their children, away from God. Instead of repenting in tears and brokenness and coming back home and come back to the Heavenly Father, they actually rise up and become more defiant. They're harder. They're more repelling. They're more repulsive. They're more rebellious more now than ever. This is what they're doing. Verse 9, is my inheritance like a speckled bird of prey to me? Are the birds of prey against her on every side? Go, gather all the beasts of the field and bring them to a devout. He's comparing them to a, a, a bird that has plumage that, plumage that is beautiful, um, um, striking, but also it catches the eye of the bird of prey. Now they become a target. The more proud, the more beautiful you think you become, now the bird of prey is coming, and the hyenas are coming, and they're going to devour you. In verse 10, the image shifts. And he says, the shepherds now, the shepherds, um, my shepherds have run my vineyard. They have trampled down my field. So he's telling the people who rebel, they're going to be targets of God's judgment. God's forsaken them, abandoned them. They're going to defy like a roaring lion. Even the shepherds have trampled. What have been the results of this? Look in verse 11. It has made, it's been made a desolation, desolate. It mourns, it mourns before me. The whole land has been made desolate. Three times the word desolate is used. What looks like prosperity now will end up in desolation. What looks like everything will end up with nothing. What opens up with fullness and, and, and fruitfulness will now be completely and totally, absolutely destroyed. There will be nothing left. We've seen it time and time again. The second thing that happens to the people when they turn away from God is not only desolation, emptiness, barrenness, Look at verse 12 at the very last phrase. There's no peace for anyone. What looks like prosperity and happiness is a facade. There's no peace. What looks like the world is providing and satisfying their gratification and their needs and their wants and desires, they're going to end up with no peace at all because there's no peace without God. And then verse 13, they've sown weed and have reaped thorns. They've strained themselves to no profit. But be ashamed of your harvest because of the fierce anger of God. God is not going to let them go. Very vivid image. Now we see this. So here, the question, the complaint, why do the wicked prosper? God responds, don't worry about the wicked. Pay attention to yourself that he's preparing you for godliness. He's conditioning you for what's ahead. But then he says, by the way, I've got the wicked covered. I'm gonna forsake them, I'm gonna abandon them, I'm gonna deliver them over. They're gonna be desolate and there's gonna be no peace whatsoever. But then he puts an interesting section in verses 14 through 17. He's gonna address the nation's who God used, like the Egyptians, the Edomites, the Moabites, Amorites, the Arameans, the Assyrians, and now the Babylonians, that God used them as his instruments of discipline to, eat, to, to the people of Israel. Look what he says in verse 14. And this is a promise of hope that he's going to give the nation. But before the hope comes, punishment comes. Thus says the Lord God, concerning my wicked neighbors in verse 14, who strike at the inheritance. So these are the enemies that God used to strike at Israel because of Israel's disobedience. And he says this, Behold, I'm about to uproot them from their land and will uproot the house of Judah from among them. So there's going to be two uprootings. The first one is after Jerusalem's uprooted from or Judah from their homeland and being taken to captivity in Babylon, he's going to eventually bring them back, uproot them from Babylon and bring them back to home. But it's going to take some time. They have to go through the discipline process. 
But then the ones who uprooted Israel and Judah and took them to Babylon, then he's going to uproot the Babylonians. And he's going to destroy them. And the Medes and the Persians will take care of that. But then something unusual happens in verse 15. An offer is made. It will come about that after I have uprooted them, that's the foreign enemies, then I will again have compassion on them. And I will bring them back, each one to his inheritance and each one to his land. So he's offering them an expression of grace. That even though I've used you to punish my people, and even though I've punished the punishers, there's going to be a season when you're going to be able to come back home or you're going to be able to come to the Lord. That's an opening. So let's look at the two choices they have. First choice is found in verse 16. Then if they really learn the ways of my people. So now you, you all of a sudden, they've been the, the torturers, the tormentors, the oppressors. Now they're going to become the students. They're going to become the disciples. They're going to become the learners. And they're going to learn to swear by my name, which means they're going to switch allegiances from their God to Yahweh. And if they do, look what God will do. As the Lord lives, which is a way of, as God be my witness, he says, even as they taught my people to swear by Baal, they will be built up in the midst of my people, which means God will put them in the family of God. A couple years ago, we had a, a, a member in our church that lost his mom. She was in her 80s. Part of, the mom was a strong Christian, but I'd always prayed for her husband, our member's father, but he had never come to Christ. He was very secular in his thinking, just not important. But at the age of 90, again, this man that's been prayed for by his wife before she passed, her dying wish was that he would come to Christ. Several years later, he was offered a chance, an opportunity to come to Christ. And he prayed to receive Christ so on a Saturday. That Saturday night, he boxed up all the house idols, all the elements of foreign gods, and he put them in a box and put them outside the house waiting for pickup. Complete change. Not only did he do that, he began at the age of nine, he began to write by hand. He would look at the scripture and he would write the scripture out by hand on a piece of paper along with daily bread and devotions. And he put it from the hand to the paper and that paper went into his heart and to his mind. I baptized him at the age of 92. Just recently he's passed away, but everything changed. And now he's part of the family of God, and now he's in heaven with his wife. A change. We have people who come from different religions who are now maybe used to persecute Christians or torment Christians or, or antagonize Christians. Now they're part of the family of God here. This is a promise that God makes. But there's another choice. Look in verse 17. This is where we close. But if they will not listen, then I will uproot that nation and uproot and destroy it, says the Lord. So amazingly, the punishers are punished. Then God gives them compassion and opening to come to him. And if they listen and swear by my name and change allegiances and affections, then they can be a part of the family of God. But if not, God will what? Uproot them again? But he's given them a second chance. Any of you have ever been given a second chance? Something that, a do-over. Like something you just messed up on and God just forgave you. And you get to do it again. This time with a forgiven heart. That somebody actually forgave you for what you did and you've been given a second chance. Or maybe an opportunity that was closed but now it's open again. Second chance. There's a young mother, 23 years old. She gave birth to a, her son by the name of Levi at 26 weeks in her pregnancy. 26 weeks. Baby was very small. But the reason that she had to give birth is because it had a life-threatening condition of that little child at 26 weeks called spinal bifida. They took the baby out at 26 weeks. They did corrective spine surgery on a 26-week-old baby and then put the baby back in the mother's womb. 11 weeks later, gave birth. Baby's doing well. What do we call that, Levi? Second chance. What's he calling to the nations? Second chance. What's he calling Judah? Second chance. And what's he calling to us? Second chance. God is giving you another chance chance i had a brother sit here today after the first service he and i were just sitting on the altar praying he said pastor i think god's given me more than second chances he says he's given me fifth sixth and seventh and he named them all and, and he articulated well god has given him seven chances how many chances have you gotten today you get a new one if you've never received christ you have an opening today there's no guarantee that we'll be here next week 
But today, you have a chance to come to Christ. You've been on the peripheral for a while. You've been waiting. You've been analyzing. You've been thinking about it. You've been back and forth, but God's giving you a chance. Next month, we'll have another baptism. Some of you are waiting for a second chance. God is giving you a chance to express that faith outwardly, just like we just saw the eight confess their faith in Christ. Some of you are struggling in marriage right now, but God's giving you a chance to come back and be restored and be made whole. God is giving you a chance. God has given you a chance to, to, to make things right, a second chance. So as I pray over you today, just like we prayed last week, for those who need healing, we just ask you to open up your hands. But if you need a second chance, my prayer is that you would hear God, the one who's given Jeremiah and Judah, nations, Levi, and me second chances. God has given you a second chance today to come back to him, to come to him for the first time. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the goodness of God that you never, never, never abandon us. Father, even though we have these unbelievable complaints, and some of them are very legitimate, death threats, betrayal, family members turning against us, friends that used to be so tight as have now, Father, it's now they're, they're opponents and they're oppressive. Father, situations that used to be blessed now, Father, it feels like they're very difficult. And yet, Father, we, we're asking why do the wicked prosper why does it look like they're flourishing and fruitful and prosperous and successful? And Father, we're barren and we're, we're dry and there's nothing coming. And yet, Father, you're faithful. You're reminding us that you're conditioning us for what's ahead. But you also said you're gonna take care of the wicked. But Father, we come down to that last part where you've given everybody involved a second chance. And I pray that today each person will hear your heart and your offer of grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Why don't you look at the questions very quickly? First one is, describe your spiritual high this week and spiritual low. Now, we've had quite a few highs in IBC, unbelievable answers to prayers, miracles, God's taking care of things, but we've also had a few lows this week, devastating news, crushing set of circumstances. I don't know about you, but lately, it feels like I have highs and lows, but nothing in between. It is bad, and like it's, it's being stretched. It's like all the way up there or all the way down here, but nothing in between. So what is your high and what is your low this week? And I do want you to share with one person today, okay? Second one. Now this is an honest question. I want you to first response. This is like when I tell you to think of a color, what's your first thing you think of, right? This is kind of that test. So here it goes. When you see the wicked prosper, what is your first response? When you see godless people, who hate God, who defy God, hate Christians, and when they're flourishing, what is your first response? How many of you say, hallelujah? God has given me a chance to condition myself to be stronger. I am so glad they're prospering. Is that your first response? How many of you say, God, keep blessing them? I don't think you're blessing them enough. Double portion their blessing. And maybe they'll see the goodness of God. Is that our first response when we see the wicked prosper? Or is it like this, crush them? burn them, torture them, right? So that's our response. But God is asking, like, what is our response? And God's response is maybe not pay attention to the wicked prospering. Maybe we need to pay attention to our own heart, making sure that we're walking with God. And the last one, we close with this. Describe a second chance that God has graciously given you this season. I've had quite a few of them this week where people gave me another offer to get back into a conversation that before I was invited out of the conversation or I walked away, but they invited me to come back in. Second chance. Get a chance to redo some things where I messed up on. Second chance. Name one second chance that God has given you. How can you not smile today as you walk out of here? If you've been given a second chance, that somebody has forgiven you, that somebody has given you another opportunity, that God has opened that door again, a second chance. So as we pray today, let's stand. And remember, my prayer every week is when we say this prayer that it's not mechanical, it's just not going through the motions or the words, but the more you repeat it, that it would actually become a part of you, that it would be your DNA, that it would be who you are as a child of God. So let's pray this prayer together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. 
for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You've anointed my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Go with God's second chances and it's a blessing. And if you want to get ahead, we'll be in Jeremiah 17 next week, okay? I know you can't wait to hear another encouraging word of hope from Jeremiah. So let's prepare ourselves. Go with God's blessing, obviously.